this book may not be a bestseller, but devouring its contents is a gentleman known as Andy, Handy Andy, a jerk of all trades, about to tackle a lathing and plastering job. Having more than his share of self-confidence, he figures on learning everything in one easy lesson. And so to work. Obviously, we're not going to say the job's beyond the ability of the average man, especially with gypsum. But Andy isn't exactly average. At least he's bright enough to use gypsum lab. Well, now let's see, where shall we start? This seems like a nice place. Now to line it up. Ah, perfect. <laughs> slipped a little. Where are those nails? We'll show who's boss around here. Takes a little practice, but things are coming along fine, just fine. There, you little nail. That does it. Oh, how do you like that? Better watch someone who knows his job from long experience. He's a real craftsman. And he's using standard or plain gypsum lath, which in recent years has become the national favorite, the lath with which all others are compared. 16 inches wide and 48 long, it fits any standard framing. He's using a blue gypsum lath nail with a 3 8 inch head driven just right. It compresses but doesn't break the paper. An expert uses five nails for the right holding power, not four. Ah, he's really spitting them in. And uh, speaking of experts, uh-oh, that looks like a roofing nail. Oh, no, no, driven too hard, Andy. And why three nails? That's a costly shortcut. Vertical end joints must be staggered to give the necessary strength. So by scoring with the hatchet blade, then snap, another snap, a clean, fast break. Thanks to long research that developed the special gypsum core and the unique properties of the paper that envelops it. Both must conform to high standards of strength. And when the wet plaster is applied, the tiny gypsum crystals must permeate the paper to make a strong and lasting bond. Well, it looks as though our scholar is making progress too. Of course, he has the plaster side of the lath against the studs, but uh, maybe we're too critical. Well, have to get rid of that somehow. So with a trusty blade, a healthy slice, and mm, beautifully done. The edge may be just a trifle ragged. The piece that was cut off to stagger the joints is not discarded. It fits this 16 inch space perfectly. That reduces waste and conserves man hours. Complete coverage and close fitting is important, as around this light switch. He carefully scores the paper around the opening. Cross scores it. And taps out the core. A perfect fit and easy to plaster over. Now, another old master shows his stuff. If this doesn't crack the plaster, it isn't Andy's fault. With gypsum lath and know-how, curved surfaces are taken in stride. With framing that provides proper support for nailing, the lath is scored at intervals to accommodate the curvature, whether it be gentle or sharp. Gypsum lath is designed to be truly versatile. Surprisingly enough, attachment to steel is no problem. Even unusual jobs like this are quickly done. And what could provide a more suitable plaster base for such a job? Scrap pieces like this always find their logical niche. This one came from the ceiling. The curve is scored on the back, then on the front face. A master craftsman and a perfect arch. Any movement or vibration of a building creates unusual strain at corners, so they are reinforced with cornerite. It is stapled or nailed to the lath, never to the framing. Exterior angles are reinforced with metal corner bead, nailed into the studs. 
Its edge also determines the plaster thickness for the two intersecting walls. Well, here's the architect. He rigidly inspects his lathing and plastering because he knows that the finished walls and ceilings constitute about 70% of the visible room. They must be pleasing and enduring. But a beautifully decorated surface can be no better than the lath foundation, and errors are easily corrected now. End joints are staggered, laths are held in moderate contact, and solid against the framing with five nails, neither under nor over driven. Wall strength is vitally related to plaster thickness, so he measures the wood grounds placed around all openings and at the base, as well as corner bead, to assure himself of the full one-half inch plaster thickness so necessary for lasting crack-free walls. Aha, lovely. Well, maybe just a little off here. Already Andy's suffering delusions of grandeur. An architect certainly wouldn't approve such work. We better take a look at a good job. This is plain or standard gypsum lath. Perforated lath permits the plaster to rivet itself through the holes. Gypsum lath with aluminum foil. Looking into the wall from the outside, we see the aluminum on the warm side of the wall. This animation visualizes an exterior wall on a cold day. The clouds represent the invisible but ever-present vapor or humidity in the room, so essential for healthful living. But it tries to escape to the cold outside air. So much of the vapor passes through the wall, and upon reaching the cold wall exterior, condenses into water and often freezes. It causes dampness that rots lumber, damages interior decoration, and peels outside paint. Obviously, the vapor must not be allowed in the stud space. And so aluminum foil gypsum lath is used for insulation. Enough gypsum lath is produced every day to build 1,500 homes or apartment units because builders recognize it as practical and versatile, economical in material and labor costs, and finally because it reduces plastering costs. Yes, good plastering is economical, and this is one of the essentials, the proportioning of sand and plaster. With water in the mixer, the plasterer adds half of the sand, or seven shovels, for this first coat. Then the 100-pound bag of unfibered gypsum cement plaster, a high-strength plaster for use with aggregates. Then another seven shovels of sand, making 14 in all. Since a number two shovel carries 15 pounds, that's about 200 pounds of sand to each 100 pounds of plaster. The only correct mix for the first coat over any lap. 14 shovels of sand to each bag of plaster. We depend upon the base coat for the strength of the plaster job, and one added part of sand reduces its strength as much as 50%. But that mix can be expected to endure the life of the building. Good plaster doesn't come by accident. Years of research have developed a gypsum plaster for every purpose, properly conceived and precision made. Clean washed sand is mighty important to the strength of the plaster and should be tested for loam, silt, and clay impurities. The hand test reveals none of these adulterants. But here is dirty sand that may reduce the plaster strength as much as 50%. Or shake a bottle containing sand and water. Let it settle. The murky water and a layer of sediment over the sand are adulterants that make it unfit for plastering. Under a magnifying glass, properly graded sand looks about like this. The small particles nestle between the large ones. So when gypsum is added, each and every particle is completely coated. That makes strong walls. But with sand particles of uniform size, large voids are inevitable between them. And even though the correct amount of gypsum is added, there wouldn't be enough to completely coat the ungraded particles of sand. Back to proportioning. This is good sand, but with insufficient gypsum. Too many shovels of sand. The result is weak plaster. This is the right plaster for faithful walls. Clean graded sand, properly proportioned, and thoroughly coated. Now Andy, the learned plasterer, shows exactly how not to do the job.
The book said this is done next. Sand grading was a rather dull topic, so he skipped it. Now, a few rocks must be removed. Well, you handle those tools well, Andy. Oh, oh, excuse me, we have a craftsman applying the first coat with long, easy strokes. From the second of contact, the gypsum strikes into the pores of the paper. When dry, it takes more than 800 pounds to pull one square foot off the lath. This is a three-coat plaster job. The first is about a quarter inch thick. The surface is raked and cross-raked to provide additional bond for the next coat. Because of the extreme suction of the partially dry first coat, the second is mixed with three parts of sand to one of gypsum. That calls for 20 shovels of sand to each bag of gypsum cement plaster. True surface walls are the result of good workmanship. Having accelerated the set of the plaster, a dot is placed near the corner by this expert. And with a level, he plumbs its surface to the base ground below. Starting from the ground at the door, which is plumb, he runs a screed to the previously established dot. But Andy didn't read far enough for screeds. He's fighting it into the wall. With a straight edge, a true line surface is established between the wood ground and the plaster dot. That plaster screed serves as a guide to plaster thickness. It takes but little time to install, eliminates curved surfaces, and helps ensure proper plaster thickness. Now the second coat is applied, exactly as was the first. This small face is first plastered because it establishes the true corner angle. By rotting from the corner beads of the opening, the true plane of the small wall is established. This expert obviously plans his work. A few strokes of the derby, and it's done. The plaster goes over the first coat with enough pressure to force it into the keys of the scratched surface. Rotting between ground and plaster screed takes off the excess plaster and reveals low spots, thus enabling the craftsman to produce a level wall and to ensure a full thickness of plaster. Then with a the derby, the wall is floated to provide a roughened surface to receive the finished coat. Perforated lath is plastered in exactly the same manner as plain lath. The plaster literally rivets itself through the perforations to provide greater fire resistance. This wall, plastered on both sides, is one hour fire resistant. These plaster screeds on the ceiling are good insurance against thin plaster where good strength is very important. Equally as satisfactory is the two coat or so-called double up method of plastering. It's similar in all respects to the three coat method except that the full half inch thickness is applied at one time. The mechanic is doubling back right over the wet plaster and leveling out the full grounds. Yes, Andy's still at it. The plaster's getting harder every minute and heavy as the mortgage on his dream house, or should we call it Nightmare Manor. only known, Andy would have used a light aggregate, either perlite or vermiculite, something new in plastering. They are more effective than sand for fire protection. One cubic foot of vermiculite or perlite, weighing no more than 10 or 12 pounds, replaces 100 pounds of sand in the plaster mix. Now the architect inspects the base coat plaster. He sees good straight angles and walls, but he wants to know about the strength. So, with a nail, he scratches the surface. The sharp ring and flint-like resistance to scratching is proof enough that it will be a lasting wall. A good job, well done. Oh, what endurance! There's nothing cheap about Andy, so he uses plenty of sand with this sad result.
That's lime putty, either hydrated or quick lime soaked to a smooth putty. There are many good finish plasters, but white coat consisting of lime putty and gypsum gauging plaster is widely used because it's an ideal base for decoration. By itself, lime doesn't set. Furthermore, it shrinks upon drying, so we add gypsum to give it strength, and the gypsum sets before the lime can shrink. When the lime putty is formed into a donut ring, water is added, and then the gypsum gauging plaster. But the amount is the important thing. It's easy to remember, 25 pounds of gypsum gauging plaster to 100 pounds of lime putty. That's one hardful. The mix is thoroughly kneaded and blended to avoid streaks and lumps of ungaged lime that would shrink on the wall. A thin coat is then scratched hard into the partially dried base coat. It's so plastic that long sweeping strokes can be used. After the first application is taken up, he trowels on a leveling coat. This is the final finish. The surface is left as smooth as possible with the trowel. Just before the gypsum gauging plaster begins to set, it should be troweled hard and brushed using water on the brush. Finally, it's slicked down with brush and water to a shiny, smooth surface. To be brutally frank about it, Andy, your work lacks a certain something. Brains, maybe. Congratulations, a complete fiasco. Gauging plaster would have prevented this atrocity. Well, Andy's smart enough to know when he's licked, so he asks the expert's advice with a little double checking on the QT. Hmm, that ain't the way the book says. Ah, oh, fooey, let's get down to business. With gypsum and a real craftsman, any job's in the bag. This distinctive game room is the result of expert craftsmanship and well-engineered materials. Gypsum finishes make possible decorative treatments of endless variety. Each finished wall is backed up with the strength of gypsum lath and plaster. And remember, gypsum is fireproof. Wood framing is protected while the gypsum is slowly and completely calcined, a vital safety factor in huge and heavily congested structures. Charming homes like this are equally safeguarded. Harmonious surroundings of every style are achieved by architects and decorators throughout America utilizing gypsum to add a magic touch of beauty for gracious modern living. <laughs>